As we kicked off the new year, we talked about being whole in spirit, soul, and body. And I don't know how that's been going for you so far. Hopefully, you're making some strides. But we want to make sure that effort continues on for you. We've got an event that's happening next Saturday morning called Resolve. It's going to be at 9 a.m. here at Journey Church. Bold City Health is helping put this event on. And they're going to give you some great tools to be successful. You'll come away with a four-week free exercise program. They will challenge you and encourage you to get your fitness on track, spirit, soul, and body. I hope you'll come out and join us at 9 a.m. You can go to boldcity.events to register or just show up here at 9 a.m. in the morning next Saturday. We hope to see you here. Let's go ahead and pray, and I'll do my best to get us into God's word. I don't know if I can compete with that hot now light. Come on, Jesus, but we will do our very best. Lord, we are captivated by your love. It has been an honor to be here this morning praising you with other believers who are excited about what you are doing in their lives and in the lives of others. And today as we open your word and we study this topic of the gospel, this topic of creation, could we get a glimpse of your glory? Could we see you for who you are? Would it challenge us? Would it change us? And as Jim said, would it transform us? Would we have the ability to put your word into action in our lives. Lord, we're not here just to be informed. We're here to be transformed as only you could do by the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you help us? Would you guide us? Would you give us strength? Would you teach us? Would you mold us? Would you make us? In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So at Journey, we strive to be what we call a gospel-centered church. So What does that mean? What is the gospel? We did an entire series on this subject a number of years ago. So if you want to see what that was all about, go to our website or go to our app. You can download it and look for the message series, What is the Gospel? It's very foundational to the teachings here at Journey. It's obviously foundational to the Bible. We'll talk about that in just a moment. It's a matter of first importance that we understand this subject of the good news of Jesus Christ and how it applies to our life. This topic of creation, fall, rescue, restoration, and glorification. This epic story, we started this series called Epic from the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1-1 where we're going to start in just a moment all the way in to the end in Revelation is a story about God. It's about Jesus Christ and his rescue. So when you start to dive into this subject, here's what Paul says about it. Maybe as a good starting point for us, 1 Corinthians 15-1. It says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and which you stand and by which you are being saved. For if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed it in vain, for I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised again on the third day in accordance with scriptures. Now, there's a lot of things in our life that's important, is it not? It's kind of important to have a job for most of us. Can I get an amen? Right? It's important for us to have a job. If you're married, it's important for you to have a strong relationship with your spouse. Can all the ladies say amen, right? That's super important. If you have kids, it's important that you love your kids and that they're very important in our lives and we want to sow the gospel into them. But Paul's saying that you can have all of these other things, but if you miss the first thing, then your life's going to be completely out of whack. He says, if you don't focus on the matter of first importance in your life, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the fact that God is the creator of the universe, that we as human beings have fallen in sin, that we have this sinful nature that holds us back from living the kind of life that God would have us uh, live, that puts us in a place of cosmic rebellion against the God of the universe, that God came to rescue us by sending his very own son, Jesus Christ, to save us. Anybody know him? Anybody worship him? Anybody been saved? Praise God. And that he wants to restore us. He wants to make all things right. And ultimately, he is glorified in all of these things. And we get to live in glory with him as believers for all eternity. He's saying there's nothing more important than that story and understanding it and marveling in it and reveling in it and enjoying it and worshiping God in it and through it and living it out in our everyday lives. He's saying that is the most important thing in life. 
So I'm super excited that you're here today, that you've made this Sunday morning a focus of your attention, of gathering together with other believers, of worshiping God through song, of worshiping God with your finances, of worshiping God by the listening of the word and the application of it throughout the course of the week, not just on Sundays, right? See, there's people gathered in stadiums that were filled all throughout the week for weeks and weeks and weeks leading into this week, right? that worship other things from time to time. Amen, right? So today, the Jaguars are there worshiping, not worshiping, (laughs) you're here worshiping, thank God. But the Jaguars are gonna be playing, and for many, they see that as something more important than being in church on a Sunday morning. But you guys are like, man, we are here, we are all in, we want to know God, and that sadly is rare in our generation. All the more importance for us who are believers to live and walk and act and talk in the image of the glory of God, which is the subject that we're gonna be uh, studying today. So this message of the gospel is crucial to our everyday lives. Paul calls it the matter of first importance in our lives. Would we glory in it? Would we live in it? Would we let it save us? Would we let it sanctify us? Would this epic story, God's story, change us from the inside out? Can I get an amen? See, when we look at life and we look at God, we have these conceptions that we build up in our hearts and our minds, some of which are true and others of which are not true, that we need to discard, that we need to put by the wayside. I think deep down, those of us who are believers, we know he loves us. That is a good thing. That is a right thing. That's something we need to stand upon. We know that he died for us. He died for our sins. But then we start to say things, but he knows we're human. When we sin, isn't that God's job to forgive us, right? So then sometimes we justify our sins and we walk in them and we accept them and we make them less than what they really should be in our lives. We try to minimize our sins and we look at other sins and sometimes we magnify the sins in other people's lives while we try to minimize our own. None of you have ever done that, right? You look at other people and say, God, judge them, but don't judge me. Come on, Jesus, right? Like judge this, oh good, right? We can explore that one a little further in just a moment as well. See, many of the assumptions that we have are wrong. See, our relationship with God is not some kind of 50-50 where when we do right, God blesses us, and when we do wrong, God doesn't bless us. There are some truths in that, but guess what? God loves you in the midst of your sin is one of the first truths that you need to begin to understand. It's no license to sin. It doesn't mean that we can continue to go on sinning, but he loved us enough to send his one and only begotten son while we were yet sinners to save us, to change us, to transform us. Why did he do such a thing? I think we need to start all the way in the beginning. Genesis chapter one, verse one, for those of us who are reading the one-year Bible, hopefully you're a little bit further ahead than that in scripture, but we're gonna start right there today with a very profound statement that's found in that first verse. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't say in the beginning, Eric. It doesn't say in the beginning, Mary Jo. It doesn't say in the beginning, insert your name. Because sometimes we think life revolves around us, if we're honest, do we not? We live in this place of me, myself, and I. We live in this place where the world revolves around us and our wants, our needs, our desires. But this is in the beginning, God. This story is about God. He invites us into it. He allows us to be a part of it. He wants to use us in the midst of it to help communicate his story to others who are far from him with the hope that they too will follow hard after him and become believers in him and worship him and enjoy him forever, right? But this story is fundamentally not about you and I. I don't know about you, but I had to come to grips with that. We were at a uh, table yesterday with a five-year-old, and uh, the five-year-old that we were with was not the best trained, so to speak, at that particular age, and um, she had a coloring book, and I wanted to color with her and show off my awesome coloring skills. So she's sitting next to me, and I pull out the little crayon, and there I'm wanting to get in there and color the flowers, and she's like, mine! I'm like, no, ours! You know, I'm fighting to get it back. Mine, no, ours. I want to color with you. I want to hang out with you. I want to show you. I want to enjoy time with you. I didn't have to teach her to say mine. 
as adults, don't we often, too often say mine? Don't we make it all about us? But God's saying something different here in scripture. In creation, we need to come to grips with the fact that we're created beings, that he created us, that he has authority over us, that he could tell us the things that we should do and shouldn't do. This is the God who loves us and sets boundaries in our life not to restrict us so much as to put us at a place of joy, as to put us at a place where we're on the right track. You see, when we go outside of the bounds that he puts in place for us, we wake up with a hangover. We wake up with guilt. We wake up with a sense of mourning, knowing that we've done something wrong, that we've disappointed him, that we haven't given him his esteem, that we haven't given him his due place. So for those of you who might not be saved, I remember when I was unsaved and I saw these Christians, you know, before Mary Jo and I used to go to the beach every weekend, we'd be drinking, we lived down in South Florida, and Sunday morning, the furthest thing from our mind was going to church because all you boring people went to church. But I was hung over half the Sunday mornings and was not feeling all that good, so that wasn't much of a life. Do you hear what I'm saying, right? I found real life and real joy in my relationship with him, the creator of the universe. You see this God we serve? I don't know if I'm gonna do a great job of really demonstrating who he is. I wish I could do a better job. I think my words are inadequate for who he really is. It says that unlike us, he spoke the world into existence. You see, we as human beings, we need raw materials, don't we? So you can go out and you know, look at a new car and you go car shopping and you see all these different varieties of cars, most of which we can't afford. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? Don't go into debt over all that. But we look at these cars, we're like, wow, that is a marvel. Look how fast it is. Look how cool it is. Look how awesome that truck is. Look at those tires. This is amazing, right? Or we go out there and we look at a house and we see you know, the two by fours that went into building it and then they put it all together and we marvel at those things. How amazing, how beautiful. God didn't need any raw materials other than his voice. He simply spoke and said, let there be light, and there was light. He said, let there be an expanse between the oceans and the land, and all of a sudden land and oceans began to appear. He spoke and he said, let there be birds in the air, and birds began to fly. He said, let there be fish in the sea, and fish appeared and began to swim in the seas. All these things that we get to enjoy, all the things that we get to marvel in, those sunsets that we get to see, the feeling that we get when we go to the beach and we look out there and gaze upon it. We're gazing upon God's glory and God's majesty. When we look at the stars in the skies, if you get out of the city, amen, and you see all the stars in the skies and you glory and marvel at it. Why? Because you were made for this. Did you hear that word made? You were created to worship God and enjoy him forever. It's the matter of first importance. That's why you're here. All these other things pale into insignificance to the glory of our God. He wants us to worship him and know him and enjoy his love and enjoy his presence. And he wants us to share it with others. There's nothing more important than that. In fact, Psalms 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Romans 1.20 says, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. So he is the creator. We are creatures created and formed in our mother's womb, and he knew us before the very foundations of the earth. He gave us a purpose and a plan. He didn't create us just to go out there and be robots. He created us to be worshipers who enjoy him and enjoy his presence and get to live life in abundance, free of sin. Yes, struggling at times with it, as we'll see next week when we talk about the fall, but he wants to give us freedom from that, freedom from that kind of bondage, freedom to live for him. This is how he describes us in his word. You see, he created the water and the dry land. He created the fish in the sea. He created the birds in the air. And then ultimately, the crowning achievement of his glory was to create you and I. 
It says in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds and over the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. He created us to have dominion. He created you to be leaders. He created you to rule and reign here on earth in his place, in his power, in a righteous and justice way. Not in the ways of the world, but in a very different way. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. If you believe this, you believe there is a creator and you believe that you are a created thing. God created you in his image. So I ask you today, how do you think you're imaging him right now? There's a lot of people being quiet in here right now. Come on, some of y'all got to be rejoicing. Some of y'all got to be fired up. Sure, we probably image him poorly at times, right? He knows this. You're not surprising him. But he doesn't want to leave you there. See, from the moment you get saved, we talked. I'll give you a little glimpse of the future of the gospel. It said he comes and he rescues us, and then he begins to restore us. He begins to sanctify us as we submit by the power of the Holy Spirit to the things that he's wanting to change in our lives. He begins to transform us from glory to glory that we could better reflect who he is so that when others gaze upon us, they see him in our reflection. When we go to be with him on that last day that we have on earth, may we look the most like him as any other point in our life, right? That's the goal as we continue to age, as we continue to get closer to meeting him face to face and going into glory. Maybe as further evidence of this, you need to not look much further than stars that are out there, not the stars in the sky, but the ones that we, sent, we tend to worship here on earth. The Tom Brady's of the world, right? Be it the sports athletes that we all look up to, or maybe the musicians, or maybe those musical stars that are out there. Think, think about the end of most of them. The king of pop, Michael Jackson, how did he end? How about the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley? I'm not going to do no hip shaking up here today. Come on. How did he end, right? Whitney Houston, the queen of pop, right? Why do so many struggle with that level of fame? They were never created to be worshipped. You were never created to be first. You're created to bear the image of the one who created you. You were created to reflect his glory. Why do all of us somewhere deep within us in our sinfulness have this desire to be first? I think about the selfie generation for a second, right? I put a post on Facebook this week. Your happiness in life is directly proportional to how much time you spend on Facebook in a negative way. What do I mean by that? See, we go on Facebook, we go on Instagram, and we get these polished, cleaned up pictures of what people's lives are all about. They go out there and they post all of their best moments, and then we feel so inadequate. So and so just went to Japan, and they had this awesome time, and they went on vacation, and all I could do is barely get out of Middleburg, right? And -and so-and-so in their picture, they lost so much weight and they looked great and it was awesome and they took 52 selfies before we saw the one that they put up there and then they doctored it up afterwards too, right? It's not a real image and portrayal of life. Very seldom do people go out there and post the real things that are going on in their life. They don't post the fight that they were having between their wife on Facebook, right? They don't post these kinds of things. They only post the best, they post the highlights of their life and that's not real life. The selfie is the height of opposition to what this set of verses says. We are created and formed in the image of God to reflect his image and his glory. Might we set down the phone at times? Might we try to not make the kind of life out there that we want others to perceive of us in some fake way? Would we be real? Would we love one another? Would we take the masks off? Would we help one another? Would we be conscious of that? Yes, we all want to put our best foot forward. Don't get me wrong in saying that. Of course we do. But man, buffer that with some of the reality of life and let's put the Facebook feeds down sometimes. And like next week when we have 50 small groups, would you start getting together face to face with some other people where you could share the reality of where you're really at? Because in that you'll start to get help. 
There'll be a hope that comes in the gathering together of believers in that kind of way. Don't miss out on that. This virtual lives that we're attempting to live in our generation are not enough. They're fake. They're false. Could we get back to some of the good old days in that regard? I want to encourage you and challenge you to plug into a small group where you could grow in that way. Man, I went off bounds of where I was supposed to be going, but that's okay. Come on. As we think of the gospel, we need to realize that it is God's response to the bad news of sin. Sin is a person's rejection of God's rights over him. Did you get that? See, when we try to minimize sin and try to say it's not so bad, what's actually happening is we are thumbing our nose at the creator of the universe saying that our ways are better than his ways. We are declaring ourselves to be God. We are rebelling against the very God who created us. That is the real problem with sin, not the fact that you just smoked weed this morning. The fact is that you're saying that your ways are better than his ways and that you could do whatever you want. You're rebelling against God, and the penalty for that is death. The penalty for treason is death. You are committing treason against the Most High God when you try to declare and do whatever you want to do and live within your own boundaries instead of living within his boundaries. Does this make sense to you today? That is the real offense. It's not ever whatever we think it is on the outside. It's that we're brave enough to say our plans are better than his plans. That's the root of it. That's the real problem with it. But guess what? He can still forgive us. He still loves us. He could change us. The Bible says here in Exodus 34, 6, 7, look how it describes who he is. The Lord passes before him and proclaim, the Lord, the Lord, a God that is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping his steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, but for him who by no means will clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Listen to the first set of verses. He's loving, he's compassionate, but he will not leave the guilty unpunished. The reason you and I are still alive is because he loves us. I deserve to die 10,000 times over for the junk that I've committed against God. You're probably in the same boat if you're anything like me, right? The only reason you're still alive is because he loves you. He's giving us that rope. We say, come home, repent. Would you please repent? Would you come home? I love you. I'm awaiting you with open arms. Would you come home? I'll forgive you. He loves you that much that we go on sinning and we keep going on doing things our own way. And he's still standing there and he said, I haven't left you. I'm standing right there. Would you just come home? Why, you know, God left me. God didn't leave you. You left him. He's still right where he was at. He's still waiting for you to come home. That is an amazing, astounding thing. An amazing, astounding thing. Because when you think of it as treason for a moment, in any other context with a worldly, worldly leader, pop, you'd be gone, right? But he loves you that much. You're still alive because of his grace and because of his mercy. But we do have to realize in that second set of statements also that he is a God who must judge in righteousness. He can't let that go on forever, even though it seemingly feels like forever and ever in our lives, right? Again, we get back to that place where it's okay if he judges somebody else. In fact, we kind of like that from time to time, right? We get offended when he wants to judge us for our sin. So when somebody else is doing something bad, you're like, God, would you judge them? Would you zap them? None of y'all have ever done. Am I the only sick person that does that kind of stuff? <laughs> Lord, just zap them. Come on, please. You see what they're doing, don't you? How did they get that promotion and I didn't get that promotion? Don't you see their heart? Why are they doing this or why are they living this way? And, you know, you see my heart, I'm trying to serve you. We minimize our sin and then we're okay with him judging others. Think about these things as we try to apply them in our life and be honest about it. God loves you just as you are, but he also loves you enough to not leave you there. I hope that makes sense. He will work with you. He will put people in your life. His desire is that you would be whole in spirit, soul, and body. In fact, he loved you so much that he sent his one and only son to die in your place for your sins that you might have life. In many ways, I feel I've done an inadequate job of describing his glory. 
I'm thinking there's a video that I want you to watch that is by a guy named John Piper, and he did an absolutely amazing job talking about God's glory, and maybe some of the imagery would resonate with us along with his words. The glory of God is the manifest beauty of his holiness. It's the going public of his holiness. It's, it's the way he puts his holiness on display for, for people to apprehend. The heavens are telling the glory of God. What does that mean? It means he's shouting at us. He shouts with clouds. He shouts with blue expanse. He shouts with gold on the horizons. He shouts with galaxies and stars. He's shouting, I am glorious. Open your eyes. Do you see it? Do you love it? You were made for this. I'm made for this. This is why I exist, to see that. Everything is pointing to that. All the glory that I thought was so attractive is going there. This is all husks and ashes. Now we see through a glass darkly, then face to face. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. So the glory that's coming is of such an all-satisfying, infinitely beautiful, totally need-meeting and joy-producing kind. 80 years of pain will be as nothing. This light, momentary affliction is working for us an eternal weight of what? Glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. God is aiming that we see and savor and treasure his glory, the riches of his glory. So I ask, do you see it? Do you love it? And I'll say again, you were made for this. Would you rise with me and bow your heads for just a moment? You were made for this. Made means created, right? God is the creator of the universe. He's the creator of you and I. What were you created for? To worship God and enjoy him forever. To worship God and enjoy him forever. And to image him well. To tell the world about this God who saved us, who delivered us, who sets us free. That's the kind of God that we serve, a God who loves us, a God who cares for us. That's why we're here this morning, to worship this king. As you walk through these doors, I don't know if you're a believer or not, but maybe something you've heard in this place from, could have been from the very beginning with the first song that was played or through the words that I've shared or through the video that you've just watched, something stirring in your heart and you just know that today's the day that you need to surrender your life to the creator of the universe. If that's you, I would love the privilege and honor of praying with you. I'd love to pray for you as you enter into this Christian life. For others of you, you are saved. You're a believer in Jesus Christ. Your salvation is secured. But you've walked away. You've been running in a different direction, and today's the day you know you need to come home. God still awaits you with open arms. He sees the extent of your sin. And he says to you this very morning, this is the very reason that I died in your place for your sins. He's been waiting for you to come home. That's why he brought you here this morning. So if you're here today and you know that you need to either dedicate or rededicate your life to God this morning, man, I would love the privilege and honor of praying for you. If that's you, all heads are bowed, all eyes are closed. Just lift up your hand real high right where you're at, and I'd be glad to pray for you. Is there anybody here today you want to dedicate or rededicate your life to God? I see your hand in the back right there. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we join with those who have raised their hands here this morning, and we rejoice 
We are grateful at your presence. We are grateful at your power. We are grateful that you are truly the king of the universe, the creator of heavens and earth, the creator of all that we see with our eyes that we glory in and magnify in, Lord God. We can't thank you enough for your presence in this place this morning. We join with those who have raised their hands and saying, yes, Jesus, we believe in you. We believe you are the one and only begotten son of the living God who died in our place for our sins that we might have life. And today we lay our sins at your feet and we say, Lord, would you please take them from us? We no longer want to carry this burden. We were not created for such a thing as this. We were created to glorify you and worship you and enjoy you for all the days of our life. But this sin has continued to hold us down. So we willingly lay it at your feet. And when we walk from this place, Lord, we have no intent to pick it back up and make it a part of our life. We ask you to fill those empty and voided places by the power of your Holy Spirit Fill us with your love. Empower us to live this Christian life. Empower us to image you well. Lord, we want nothing more than to love you and enjoy you and worship you and tell the world about you. Would you equip us for such a thing as this? Would we put your word into practice in our everyday life? Would we tell the world about who you are and your goodness and your greatness, Lord? We thank you and we praise you this morning. We rejoice with those who may have prayed this prayer for the very first time. And if you did, I want to encourage you to come to the front immediately following the service. You'll see we have some altar workers up here who would love to give you some next steps in starting off this way of life. Would everybody else put your hands together and just praise of our God. Thank you so much for being here today.